Well, it's a great honor to be here on stage with the, you know, the father of reinforcement learning and many other new things that we're going to hear about today. Um, but let me start with a very broad and general question. We've been hearing a lot of dystopian and utopian visions of AI. And as we transition in the afternoon to the big picture of the future, what are your views about human-centric or alien AI? Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Um, yeah, I, I, I would like to present a view that um, AI is really much more human-centric than we usually think about. We usually think about more like us versus them. Are the machines going to make us obsolete? Um, every competition is man versus machine. Um, but that's, that's one view, but it's only one. I think it should be balanced. Uh, so is it us versus them, or is it uh, more of us? Are we, are we them? And um, so, so let's, let's think about that. How does it, 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 it starts with the name, like the name artificial intelligence. It says it's a different kind of intelligence. It's artificial. But um, really, the, the field is defined. Uh, first of all, the idea is defined as trying to show abilities that are similar to humans. So really, even the definition, you know, like the Turing test is all about, you know, can we make a machine that's, that, that can imitate a person? And uh, many people define artificial intelligence as uh, machines that can show uh, uh, abilities that normally we would call intelligent if they were done by people. And so, so look, the, de the definition of our field is, is human-centric. It's defined in terms of humans. Um, and so maybe we shouldn't have called it artificial intelligence. Maybe we should have just called it intelligence. Um, and I think it's really a mistake that's, that's been haunting us, uh, that all, all of us now think of it as artificial. We think of it as an engineering thing. And, or um, we don't think about it as a human thing. But I think it's, AI is actually among the most human of all fields, the most human-centric of all fields. Perhaps psychology is a little bit more human-centric, but it's like the study of uh, humanity's abilities. Now, um, if you think about this, this is what is really happening today. Uh, it's not just a long-term philosophy thing, although I love philosophy, and I'm, I'm really glad that we have this, this, uh, this, it's just an opportunity to discuss philosophical things. I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm old, and so I'm permitted. Um, <laughs> The, we have sort of a philosophical uh, title to our to the section. I think it's AJ's fault, uh, and so I'm taking AJ's uh, philosophical title as a chance to be somewhat philosophical. And and it's not bad. Maybe he was trying to prevent something bad. Maybe he thought I would I would show slides with equations and something, which I normally I do. <laughs> uh, but it was part of the, the the setup for this this talk was that there would be no slides. And uh, so, so that's been prevented. Uh, the nice thing about philosophy is, well, you know, we all feel we can do it, right? Anybody here um, uh, feels they can at least participate in philosophizing about AI. Um, so let's, let's do that a little bit, and let's just note how human-centric it is. Like all the things that people are talking about, all the modern cutting-edge applications, like speech recognition, that's about getting people so they don't have to type and they can just get their thoughts onto paper and communicate it. And uh, recognizing images is to save you from having to uh, write, write words about your uh, family vacation, you know. You want to have your pictures automatically classified. And uh, even things like language translation is about people communicating to each other. Um, web search. Web search is where AI is used. You look at all the places where AI is, it's all about enhancing us as intelligent beings. Enhancing or entertain, sometimes entertaining us, but uh, enhancement is, is the fact, the fact of how AI is used today, why it's commercially important, um, and it's not about, uh, you know, it's not about beating us, it's about enhancing us. Uh, the, the game playing that you all know about, uh, which is, is just, a, uh, it's really useful. We do the games because they give us a way of measuring the, the effectiveness of our AI systems. It's not because we want to make something that beats people. It's because it's, a, it's really a methodology. And the, the point of the technology is not to beat people, but to, uh, to enhance people and to make them more effective at what they want to do. I'm fascinated by this. And if I may, I want to ask some follow-up questions. So based on what I just heard, it sounds like much of the work is that of the sensory cortex by analogy, the interface to the modalities we're used to. 
Um, and yet the inner workings of these artifacts may be an alien intelligence, meaning we understand the inputs, we understand the outputs, we purposefully train them with data sets we understand and modalities we understand. But do we understand the inner workings? Would you say the core of a reinforcement learning that is in any way a human-like thing? Um, the trick I'm going to use maybe throughout all this in, in, um, to answer Steve's questions is to uh, relate it to people. And uh, so people also have a neural network and they, they learn and they form some reflexes and some responses and some intuitions and we have no understanding of, of how we do it or how others do it and yet we trust them. So I really think it's the same for our machines. Uh, we don't understand how they work in detail. As someone said, we understand how they were made. Um, but really, why do we understand people? And why do we trust people to be taxi drivers and drive us around or to fly our airplanes or to make critical business decisions? Um, I'm not sure I do, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we sort of do and we don't. We, 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 we come to um, through experience and by the fact that they're risking their own lives as well, the taxi driver, I guess. Um, uh, but it's experience and we learn what we can trust and what we can't trust. Um, now I want to go one step further and if, if look at humanity, what is, I'm saying AI is very human centric. So we have to decide what is human, you know, and if you look at humanity, what, what are we? You know, what is, what, what is our place in the universe? I mean, we're the animal that has become um, uh, most technologically powerful. It's been the tool using animal, the language using animal. Um, we have throughout our history uh, built technology to enhance ourselves. I mean, going back to like really powerful things like a pencil and our eyeglasses. These are really super powerful. A language itself is our most important tool. Uh, and we are the tool building animal. And we are the communicating, cooperating animal collaborating animal. Um, and our place in the universe is, is to uh, build tools to make us better. And, and so what we're doing now with AI is exactly that. We are enhancing ourselves. It's the way we do with eyeglasses uh, and just the way we did with language um, to, 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 um, to be smarter, to uh, communicate better, to cooperate better, uh, this is our place, uh, and and there's, you can't separate uh, the technology from what we from the humanity. Um, so if I hear that, that that has been the path to date of augmentation and extension of our senses and modalities, our capabilities. Do you believe research along the domain of autonomous agents, robotics, emotional systems will one day be a path to AGI? Is that and, and if so? I mean, I'll just ask, yeah. do you think that will come? And then if that does come, why does that end up being human-like yeah. versus alien but understandable? Let, let's, let, let's just take the, start with the fact that there, there, there is AI research that's trying to make the system more autonomous, have its own goal systems. Um, and, and that's, you know, it's not, it's not so obviously like enhancement. Um, so I, I'd like to harken back to, to AJ's introduction. He talked about time and he talked about prediction. Prediction is really important. I agree. I agree with him. Uh, the only disagreement I might have about prediction is that I think it's more important than he does, <laughs> and it's a more it's a more subtle and complex thing than that. But prediction is is it's a it's it's appealing for this group because it's it's sort of something we all understand as business people and as ordinary people that that if you could predict things better, that would be better. If I could, if I had better predictions, I could make better decisions. So it's clearly just enhancement. It's just prediction makes you able to make better decisions. But, but uh, AI is moving beyond that and uh, it's integrating the decision making and the goals in with the prediction. And um, this, is, this is a slightly more, uh, this, is, this is more, well I guess it is more scary, but I'm not trying to, I'm trying to claim that it's not scary because we have the same problems also with people again. Like when you raise kids, when you raise kids, they're autonomous. And, and you have to worry about what goals they have, and you, try, yeah, you try to raise kids so that they aren't at least counterproductive to what you want. But but at the same time, it's valuable that that they're not entirely under your control. Um, 
Yeah, reinforcement learning, my, my area of specialty is all about building up something like an emotional system and, and absolutely autonomy in decision making. So, so it's, it's, it's close to my heart. So it, and you mentioned goals a couple of times. It seems like that may be a key element to bootstrap this whole process. And it also I see the mapping to reinforcement learning, whether you're thinking of the gameplay metaphor we can all understand, intermediate goals, long-term goals, reinforcement across the chain. Is that your opinion as well, that that will be the path to higher and higher levels of intelligence? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to have higher and higher, more and more abstract goals, and um, that's an important part of it. You can't really have goals without having a system that cares about achieving its goals, um, which means really something akin to emotional responses. Um, so, so these things fit together in autonomy. Is, do we face, as humans, a vernacular gap there? Where often folks in the room might hear words like goals or caring and wonder if we're just describing some sort of, you know, nanocentric overlay, or if that actually is what's going on and we're just going to learn gradations of these, that there's something finer grained than just human level caring, human level goal setting. There's a whole spectrum. Now, goals is just a simple word, um, um, but you can be misled by, by it as such a simple word. Um, so the only way to handle that is to replace it with longer phrases like goal seekingness or purposiveness. Purpose, I like. That's it's only a few more syllables. Um, uh, so the, the general idea of, of purpose, of caring about the outcomes or optimize your outcomes, being able to influence things towards, a, towards one thing rather than another, obviously this is essential to intelligence. If you, had, if you had just something that could sit there and predict, it could be very smart in a sense, but it wouldn't be nearly as powerful as something that would act on its predictions and which had a goal that it was trying to achieve. And I tend to define it that way. Now, before we run out of time, I want to mention one more thing about the general thing of, uh, of worrying about AI, because I want to, because I've said that it's much more human-centric human -centric than most of our press stories and our, and our worries uh, reflect. Uh, but still, I have to acknowledge that there are these worries. It's really all, almost overwhelming in the press coverage of AI that it's us versus them. And are we going to be obsolete? And, and we're going to be, and has it happened yet, and, and all things like that. And I think that is, uh, as I said, I think that's a, a mistaken way to think about it. It has to be at least balanced by the other point of view that it's us being enhanced, and it will be us making our former selves obsolete. But I sh I, there, there is a tendency, I have to acknowledge there is this tendency to classify it as us versus them. So we have to ask why that is. Now, I've blamed it a little bit on the name. We've chosen a name which makes us sound alien, which makes the AI sound alien, because we're calling it artificial intelligence. Uh, but it's not just a name. I think it's, it's a little bit deeper than that, and I think it's something we can all relate to as people. And that is, uh, imagine that we, so what I would say is that we are making new people, uh, a new kind of people that are, um, that are designed, okay? And so, uh, What's happening with the fear is this is the normal human response to a new kind of people. Like over and over again, we learn, you know, we need a new kind of, a new class of people, slightly different, maybe a slightly different color or a different religion, and we get scared of them. We have fear of them because they're different and we're going to, what do you always see that they're going to take over? You know, it's not that we're being bad, it's just that they're going to take over the, I don't know, whether it's, it's the, uh, the native people of the place you've arrived at, or in the West, you know, fear of Japan, and I'm sure, or, or, or China, uh, the different kind of people over there. Uh, and um, we always, it's a very natural human thing to be fearful of others that are slightly different from us. Um, and yet it's also human, particularly in Canada, to find a way to uh, celebrate diversity and, and welcome the others celebrate their accomplishments, and not just as they're doing well, so that's bad for us, but they're doing well and they're, they are like us. And I think that's what we have to get over with with our machines. So AlphaGo has been a really interesting test case. AlphaGo, in the, in the West, it still tends to be presented as man versus machine. But in the Go community, it was, it was like, here's this amazingly, uh, Amazing system, amazing machine that can understand Go. It's joining us 
in the, the, the infinite task of understanding this elegant game. And uh, so the response to the, the uh, AlphaGo beating the world champion was that there was enormous more, greater interest in Go, and more Go boards were sold than, than ever before. Hmm. And uh, when you look at um, uh, many of the pro players would say, you know, AlphaGo, it's very interesting. He's got these new moves, and he's teaching us. We are learning about Go from the machine, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And so I think we have to learn, find a way to, to welcome uh, this different kind of people, and their strengths are, will be different from ours. They'll have, they will be much more diverse. And uh, but w why can't we celebrate that? I think as Canadians we should celebrate <laughs> diversity. <laughs> Yay! How does this become Canadian? <laughs> oh, do, do we have to end, or do we have time for a call? No, I think we have some time. Yeah. So this is a great segue to AlphaGo, and I especially wanted to get your thoughts on AlphaGo Zero. And for those, I'm sure most of you know this in the room, but the newest version learned how to play, interestingly, by not studying human moves, but starting from just de novo, here are the rules of the game, go to town, and within 72 hours, trained itself to a state where it beat the old AlphaGo 100 to zero. And correct me if I got any of that wrong. My question to you is, throwing away the human training set seemed to be the way to make a better product. Um, how does that fit in this framework? In other words, it did so much better by ignoring the humans, right? They, if anything, held it back. We need scalable methods. Uh, Steve and I both like to show, and we didn't do it today, and no one did it today, I'm surprised. We, no one showed the exponential growth of computer power. Oh, I did. That was my opening slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Moore's Law. I came in just a minute late. Yeah. Uh, so, but I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad you did. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, and it's kind of mundane now, but it, it is, it's a profound effect, and it's hard for us to, to recognize how profound it is. Um, and... Um, we need, so we need methods that will scale with computer power. I mean, that's what I mean by it. I don't mean that they, they scale with problem size. I mean they will scale with computer power. You get more computer power, you can have a more effective system. And so we have to ask, is, is computer power the bottleneck of your strategy or not? So learning from human training sets, the bottleneck pretty soon becomes your training set. But I'm going to try this question at a slightly different angle. So early work in computer chess found that having the grandmaster accentuated by the computer was not nearly as good as just use of the computer. And if I understood the latest work with um, AlphaGo Zero, it did better without the encumbrance of the human training cycle. And doing adversarial learning with other computers just philosophically seems very foreign to what you were just talking about, that is a humanocentric approach. Well, um, not really. We as humans, we learn, we don't learn really. We learn in school. We learn a little bit in school. But we learn most about how the world works, you know, when we're very, very young and probably can't even talk yet. Um, so we learn by trial and error. The systems that were, uh, so I should say the word reinforcement learning, which is my area of expertise, my favorite, favorite subject kind of learning. And uh, reinforcement learning is what is learned in these trial, what is used in these trial, these self-play methods where you get to try out many, many games. And um, so this is, it's not learning from people, it's learning in the same way that people do. It's more, it's, it is like, it is very human-like, this learning from, from trying. Mm -hmm. um, it's, 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 it's true that you can, in game playing, you can play massive amount of experimentation, and, and, and th these methods do leverage that. Um, but the general idea of trial and error is, is doesn't require simulations. Now let me just say one more thing about that, which is uh, games are special because just for this reason, because we, we have the rules of the game that are, we can build them in, and so we know how they work. And and uh, we, we really need our, I, I forget who, who talked about like the, the vase on the, on the table and how it was about to fall off. So we know the way the physics of the world, we know how objects move, and we need to be able to plan. We need to be like AlphaGo for the real world. And for that, you have to replace the, the, the moves of the game, the rules of the game, with the rules of the world. How the, what are the laws of physics? What are, and more important than the laws of physics are intuitive things like, well, if I, if I hit my friend, you know, they'll be, they might hit me back. Okay, that's not laws of physics. Or if I scream, maybe, maybe my caregiver will come and, and help me. Uh, so we need to learn how the world works, and then we need to be able to plan with those things the way we can plan so well in, in chess and in Go and in poker as well. So I'm um, circling back with the time we have left. Um, 
I do like this larger philosophical question about AI futures, and I love this criticism of dystopian views of suddenly this alien intelligence comes out of nowhere and scares us and takes our jobs and does whatever, as opposed to the notion that you grew up with them, like a parent. And that parenting analogy, to me, is powerful because if you think of parenting the next generation, you can ask the question, would you want your grandchildren to be smarter and healthier than you, metaphorically, right? And then I think the human sentiment shifts from supremacy, like we are the end point of evolution, the buck stops here, to symbolic immortality. That, that I think is what we are as agents for a culture and humanity is to advance the ball. And if we could parent something greater than ourselves, I think we would take great pride in that. Well, I know there's a lot of people in the world work in, in the room working on that. Very well said, Steve. Let's take pride in the accomplishments <laughs> of, it, of uh, the things we, we, we create collectively as a, as a society. Thank you very much.